Welcome everybody. This is the uh, Disruptive Friday number four and uh, today we speak about uh, tracking and surveillance. Uh, I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, uh, the director of the Disruption Network Club and together with me there is uh, Lauri Love, Johanna Moll, Julian Finn and uh, also uh, behind the scenes that you don't see uh, we have Elena Velianoska and Jonas Franchi that are working on the production and the run of Adikari that from Boiling Head Media that is helping us with the streaming. So uh, I want to welcome everybody and uh, also I want to welcome our audience that is following uh, on the usual chat that we have. And uh, before going uh, into the depth of the day, I would like to remember everybody that you can use this chat actively. You can send some information about yourself. You can introduce yourself. Uh, and also you can uh, ask questions. This is the most important because uh, then at the end of the session, uh, we will have Elena that is reporting the questions to the speakers. So uh, just uh, consider the chat as a space of interaction. And now before going into the discussion, uh, I would like to ask uh, our uh, guests to introduce themselves. Uh, so we can, uh, I can we'll ask first uh, uh, Julian Finn to say who he is. Hi, I'm Julian. I'm a hacker and media artist, and I've been dealing with the intersection of technology, society, arts uh, for, the, for almost two decades now. Um, and I have uh, Yes, I've also in my professional life, I've been dealing with uh, humanitarian crises and disaster relief for uh, four years now. So I have uh, also have this perspective on that part of, uh, of the whole current situation. Um, yeah, that's a very short Thank introduction you. of myself. Thanks a lot. Also, we will go in depth of your perspective later. And then I will ask uh, Lauri to say who he is. Hi, um, my name is Lauri Love. I am, uh, I guess, an activist or hacktivist or um, uh, general internet and society busybody and enthusiast of autonomy and maintaining and defending the rights that we do have and using technology hopefully to improve the world and not slip into a totalitarian nightmare. And I think actually today is uh, very much also important to speak about uh, totalitarian nightmares. <laughs> uh, and uh, then we have uh, Joanna Moll that uh, is uh, uh, connected from uh, Barcelona. Hello, Joanna. Hello. <laughs> so uh, I'm Joanna Moll. Um, I'm an artist and an independent researcher, although my work is really at an intersection between art, technology and uh, investigative journalism in many ways. So I've been uh, researching the environmental impact of uh, internet infrastructures, of data transferring, also, I've been investigating a lot of the data ecosystem, especially when it comes to online tracking in the last 10 years. Um, and again, <laughs> the environmental impact of it all. I think it's a very important part of it. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. So thanks a lot, Tatiana, for your invitation. Yeah, no, thank everybody. I'm so happy to have this discussion online. In a sense, this is also the way we decide to frame a bit the disruption light uh, in the moments in which uh, we cannot meet each other. So we saw it with the Disruptive Friday, we also want to give a moment uh, of reflection on topics that we are all dealing with at the moment. And uh, we, for sure, we need to speak about uh, uh, tracking. Uh, this is a, a topic that uh, is so much in the news lately, but I think there is also a lot of confusion because uh, um, is uh, not only a technical topic, it's also something related to politics and society, and still is something underdeveloped to understand uh, how to deal with the discourse of tracking uh, and the corona pandemic. So at the moment, uh, the debate, I think, is also considered into a kind of dialectic. There are some that say, uh, it's important also to protect uh, the vulnerable, to try to uh, create uh, apps that allow uh, to track people and go in the public spaces, uh, because uh, if somebody has been, um, I, as uh, uh, a person that uh, has uh, 
uh, has been affected by the virus. That is important to understand uh, uh, how it's possible then to interact uh, uh, with each other and protect the people that could be harmed by that. Um, but uh, at the same time, of course, uh, this kind of uh, debate is also related to the discourse of uh, uh, control because uh, uh, you know, also at the Disruption Effort Club, we have been always very concerned with surveillance, uh, with tracking itself, uh, with the possibility of uh, uh, even create more uh, uh, pervasive control uh, through technology. And so we try to be critical on that. We want also to understand uh, uh, if uh, it's even necessary to create these apps, uh, if uh, we actually need them, or if we should use this money for uh, more important uh, issues related to healthcare, for example, uh, to the crisis we are all living. And I think in between uh, of this kind of dialectic, then there is the discourse of privacy uh, and uh, the matter of uh, if it's possible to create uh, this app in a way that they respect uh, the data of the people and so we can um, also uh, guarantee data protection. Uh, there have been a lot of development lately, for example, uh, a big debate related to the um, pan-European privacy protecting proximity tracing, or uh, like shorten the PEPPT. Um, and uh, the idea if it's possible to use uh, uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, technology uh, to protect the privacy of the people and if this is actually working or not. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of concerns. Uh, I think also today we will discuss uh, uh, both from a technological and from a political and, so, uh, and social perspective in trying to understand uh, how this debate could be unfolded and what is also the confusion around it and if uh, all of this uh, is necessary. Um, so uh, the idea of the debate was to involve uh, uh, all of you that also have a similar but uh, a different perspective uh, also because of your personal background and the way uh, and the situation that you are experiencing in your own country. Uh, something that is also pretty clear uh, is that uh, there are different uh, kind of position coming from uh, the way uh, also the different uh, countries are dealing with the problem and this related to the way they are approaching the crisis, the way public money is spent. But at the same time, uh, uh, the other side of the debate also concern, uh, uh, for example, uh, corporations, because we know that also Apple and Google have also partnered up uh, uh, to create uh, contact tracing apps. So there are many aspects to discuss and uh, we have only one hour time. So I don't think, you know, we can do an entire conference about that. But still, I think uh, I would like really to understand your point of view and also with the help of the audience, uh, try to figure out uh, uh, if in a sense uh, we think it's important to develop this technology, what is the uh, countermeasures we have to consider and also what could be the impact on the everyday life of everybody. So we start with uh, Julian that uh, is uh, living in Germany. Yeah. Uh, we have been also sharing a lot uh, with each other about this problem. Uh, and uh, since, as he was saying, he's an expert of uh, privacy and also he develops uh, a technology uh, for the vulnerable, uh, I would like to know from your point of view uh, what is happening at the moment in Germany for this debate and also uh, what is uh, your perspective on the matter? Thank you, Tatiana. So there's, it's, it's a quite complicated and complex discussion, so I'll try to cut it short in individual parts. Um, there's obviously go the debate about um, tracking apps going on here, and the debate so far has more been about should it be centralized, should it be distributed, should we use the PPPT uh, um, approach, should we involve the Apple and Google approach, can we actually use it without the Apple approach because technologically that would be possible probably, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But I would actually go a step back um, because this all came from 
the fact that Singapore introduced an app. Now, looking at it all, basically the idea of having a tracking app is, in my opinion, techno, techno solutionism at its finest. And it's also very much an exotization of the Asian, uh, of Asian countries and technology. Um, there is no proof so far that either in Singapore or anywhere else, these apps had any effect on, um, on actually uh, helping with the pandemic. Um, in fact, only roughly 20, between 16 and 25 percent of conflicting numbers there um, in Sing of Singaporeans actually installed the app. So, um, so which is much less than any epidemiologist would uh, would tell you that is needed for for the app actually to work. So this very much becomes the question of. Um, this very much becomes the question of uh, compliance um, and compliance not in a sort of comply to the state's rule sense but into a, in a, in, a ter in, in the more medical term of setting up something that should work uh, with, which needs the cooperation uh, all that are affected now compliance is driven by multiple factors uh, the first is time there's a big question of if you want to get to 60% of, uh, of the population to install something, that is levels of uh, apps like WhatsApp or much more than even Facebook has installed. So if you want to get to that sort of level within a few weeks, I would say good luck. Um, even if that works, you would have to have um, enough trust in the system, like you would have to get enough sting the system um, that, so that they would actually voluntarily install the app. Um, and that is also something that I severely doubt, given the fact that nobody has really given answers, A, on actually preserving privacy, B, on who would be running this app and how we would safeguard that, is not, that it would, would not be used to, um, to the disadvantage of, uh, of people, and especially uh, given the complex scenario that the most vulnerable people are already the, the mo people most vulnerable so to surveillance and state action are already those who are most affected by the pandemic. So if we, to put it in blunt terms, if we want the poor and the, the marginalized to uh, use this to protect themselves and protect everybody else, we may need to make them trust and we make we need to make the, build a system and a and policies around it that that don't just come from the state and and force stuff on it and because this is all so much into uh, intertwined with a sort of belief in a techno solutionistic sort of uh, an app will save us all things um there's now talk in Germany about a much broader infrastructure that will use that is talking about the use of AI to um, to track and, uh, uh, and and identify cases. Um, there's also, and this is worrying me at the most at the moment, and um, talk about using the blockchain um, or a blockchain solution to create some sort of um, immune, uh, immunity passport. Which would basically mean if something this would be um, uh, installed, people would get you know a digital version of a passport that says, "Okay, you had it. Now you are immune. Now you can go outside," which is absolute madness, considering that so many vulnerable, especially vulnerable people, would absolutely have to rely on being immune and would immediately try to get themselves infected just to get that status. So as soon as you try tie any kinds of privileges to any kind of technological solution you're gonna get you're gonna get end up in uh, a whole a whole load of problems and to um to finish this um the um so and i mean first of all the, to finish this with two points first of all the there's no they're like even if this would work and even if we could guarantee the compliance of people and everything um, we would still have to 
spend months and months. And this, by the way, Tatiana is not, I don't care so much about the, the monetary costs of such a system because that would be benign compared to all the other costs we have, we're having right now as a state. But I'm to, I would care about the time costs. Now, if we rely on the fact that there's going to be a system, we need a backend stable enough to uh, um, stable enough to work for 50, 40, 50, maybe 60 million users. We would need to have a broad testing of all sorts of devices to make sure that the that the Bluetooth Bluetooth is stable, and we need. Um, and we need a proof that the technology actually works. This is going to cost months. It's not going to be three or four weeks. It's going to be four to six months. Now, if we put all everything on one card and say, okay, lock ourselves in for four to six months and then see what happens. And then we find out, oops, it doesn't. Well, uh, we're back to square one, which is, um, which is uh, stupid. So um, apart from that, um, even... So even if even if we were and I see no no current effort to actually preserve privacy and create uh, gain the trust of the, uh, of the people, and even if we had this, um, the whole like the whole notion of this is a much a sort of um, discipline and punish approach by the state, and I I must admit I accept that there is like in terms of a social uh, of social solidarity there is some sort of need to care for everyone else, and that means to socially distance yourself that means to lock yourself inside that means to do all sorts of measures but it is basically the symptom of a of states trying to discipline and punish the people for so long that nothing else but um punishments and fines and uh, all sorts of mandatory rules are uh, the solution to such a crisis instead of, you know, and this, this is basically the, fa the effect of uh, many, many years of increasing uh, or decreasing the, um, uh, the fundamental rights and decreasing trust in, in the people. So um, I would love to see other solutions. I do not have these, but I certainly don't think that... Um, the technological solution is one that uh, makes any kind of sense unless it's absolutely thought through and all the stakeholders are involved and that is not the case right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's thank it. you so much. I also agree with you that uh, uh, many considerations around uh, this kind of standards also don't consider uh, the digital divide, for example, that in not all the countries will be possible to uh, spread such kind of apps. And also in each country will be very difficult to understand uh, even how the people could use these, because uh, we also well know well that uh, you know, this requires also that the people have a, a phone or uh, if they don't use a phone, it requires another, the implementation of other tools. So all of these, I agree with you, takes time. And also the main question is, uh, do we need, really need the technical solution for this problem uh, to protect the vulnerable? Um, I have just an additional question for you, and then we can pass it to Lauri uh, to also know his point of view. Um, because you were also telling me uh, that uh, uh, when we were discussing uh, for these specific uh, matters, uh, uh, you don't think that the topic of surveillance should be the most important one, uh, and you were also more concerned with the discourse of privacy. Uh, but uh, we also saw that there have been evolution uh, on the PEPPT lately uh, that perhaps is not protecting so much the privacy as they were mentioning before. So maybe you want also to tell us what is your perspective on the discourse of uh, uh, privacy versus surveillance in this kind of uh, topic. So it's, for me, it's, so for, first of all, to preface this, you don't need to look at other countries for the digital divide. Uh, there's enough places just around Berlin that are really badly covered with cell phone network and where a tracking app would be difficult. But um, so surveillance versus privacy for me it is my so i personally can accept a certain level of surveillance for a certain period of time 
if it is guaranteed that it is to stop after and if it is just for the purpose of this pandemic, um, which is hard enough to set up, but not entirely impossible. However, this needs a deep, deep level of trust. And this is something that is currently not being tried to, to, uh, to install. Like, whoever is trying, you know, the, 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 the driving, driving actors on this are talking about what could work and what could give us the ma maximum effect in a sort of, out of a sort of worst case, we will force it onto everybody perspective and not out of a, how do we gain the trust of everybody so that they would do this voluntarily. And this could do, be, for example, an independent foundation that is very much safeguarded and locked down afterwards. This could be all sorts of, um, this could be all sorts, uh, not that not being the single measure, but this could be all sorts of measures. But it needs to be that in order for people to actually be willing to uh, to use the app. Because worst case, you know, phones batteries will die, or people will just not forget their phones inside, or all sorts of other things um, that will make people evade the surveillance that they are feeling. And if uh, as long as they are um, as long as it's um, as long as people can't trust that whatever is done is in their best interest, and I mean this in the most positive way, is in their best health interest and is to be, is for their actual safety, um, we're gonna we're gonna have a, a massive problem, and um, I just don't see this right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So then I will pass uh, the word to Lauri. And would you like to tell you to tell us your perspective about the subject? Yeah. Okay. So, well, um, this is a nice change for me because it's usually my job to um, rain on the parade and piss on the fireworks and pop all the balloons. And in this case, I might be able to be marginally less pessimistic than the, than uh, Julian. Um, which is to say, I think there can be some benefit from uh, technology. It's obviously not a panacea. Um, you can see that easily just by considering what percentage of the world has access to smartphones um, and it's certainly not at enough saturation um, in parts of the developing world for there to be the efficacy which is you know, some, somewhere about 60 percent um, for the contact tracing to be sufficient for the purposes it requires and there's many places where there just isn't uh, the availability of the technology itself in, in terms of the hardware and um, the the concerns um, with privacy um, I'll just give a quick report because I spoke to someone who's very involved in the um, lobbying in the European Union Commission and Parliament, um, and um, that's Naomi Colvin, from, who, who was with the Courage Foundation, who uh, helped me in my extradition case quite a bit. And um, there was initially a lot of good effort and energy expending, so PPEPT consortium um, had a lot of buy-in from the cryptographers. They suggested a decentralized solution, which um, from a um, um, privacy and autonomy perspective is much better than something that's centrally administrated and uh, gives trust into uh, effectively governments and security services. Um, this created something called D3P. Um, uh, the counter pressure to that was uh, the governments, um, particularly the UK, Netherlands, um, and uh, sorry, the UK, Germany, and France, who prefer to do things more centrally. Um, and then in a sort of, something that's we're getting a bit more used to um, the tech giants not necessarily being the evil supervillains. Um, Google and Apple have um, attempted to create a proposal that is privacy preserving and push back somewhat against the tendency um, of nation states to just do it in a kind of spy, spy and surveillance manner. Um, uh, on the other side of the world, we have Australia, who, due to geographical proximity, just want to copy Singapore, um, which was a centralized app. So that's more thumbs down from our point of view. Um, whereas we have Spain and Switzerland are in, in better communications with the cryptographers. And then in the Netherlands, they audition seven different apps and don't feel that they can proceed with any. So we, we have this kind of cacophony, which is always the case when a problem first manifests. Everyone tries to go about solving it themselves. And then there's a time that it takes to amalgamate towards a sort of consensus and um, uh, ideally in an administrative level that would probably come from the European Union or um, Commission or Parliament um, but there's this phrase from the early days of the internet and it's still a kind of guiding principle of the working groups is 
thing you want to have is rough consensus and working code, and it's it's not clear that there is uh, either yet, um, and whether they're uh, over the horizon uh, remains to be seen. But I, I don't think we should abandon efforts because the things that would make this palatable, which is that we're not being followed everywhere. Um, I should also just remind people for the avoidance of doubt, we are being followed everywhere and your government is using your phone to track you continuously. So the issue isn't that this will suddenly manifest, the issue is it becomes laundered and legitimised um, and it comes out of the dark. So the same problem that we had with Snowden, um, he went to great courageous efforts to let us know about these terrible privacy invading uh, bulk surveillance things and the net effect was they became normalised. Um, which wasn't necessarily a failure of his efforts, but um, the ability of society to respond to that revelation um, did not meet uh, the what we would have liked. Um, so the big risk um, is that um, the international security services cabal of the five eyes and more globally uh, will use this as an opportunity to um, normalize what they are already doing and to make it voluntary and then the genie is even further out of the bottle. And we, we actually saw in Israel, um, this sort of typical panache, they just said, oh, hey, we're already tracking everyone. We'll just repurpose it for this contact tracing. And um, I don't know to what extent there's been a backlash against that. So um, we have to remember that we um, are not necessarily representative as people having this conversation in these terms of the wider population for whom um, due to a a lack of digital literacy or just having other concerns in their lives, this is not the issue. That The issue for them is when do I get to go to the pub again? When do I get to see my family again? And um, there is a mounting pressure um, that will eventually boil over into dissents. And we already see that in places uh, like France where the uh, lockdown has been a lot more um, authoritarian and a lot more um, policing by the, the fist or the... Um, not the, the stick rather than the carrot, and then there have been riots in suburbs of Paris. They're, they're pretty good at that sort of thing. And uh, in in America, you've got these um, right wing people having protests with guns and signs saying "Let the weak die." Um, and you might think that's you know really on the far end of insanity, but um, um, I don't think we should underestimate the potential of the collective consciousness of society to move towards a social Darwinism and I think you know in, in all of the people here can look back historically and see issues of that and uh, especially me in the UK with the heritage of the British Empire and Thomas Hobbes who kind of came up with a lot of this thought um, so we can do more than nothing at all by harnessing technology what we have to understand is that it's not going to be a panacea it's not going to be sufficient in itself it needs to be seen within the context of um, I would use the term cybernetic, so it's the rich interaction between the technological system and the behaviours of the people interfacing with it. Um, and um, you, you need to have the other structures in place. So con contact tracing is is a science that is relatively well developed and elaborated, but it requires people on the ground. You can't just offload this all to technology, and that is um, unfortunately the tendency with this tech saviorism um, to have the idea that because we have all this technology and power at our fingertips, or some people have it at their fingertips, it kind of instills this messianic complex that uh, you can solve everything at the uh, click of a button by deploying some code. It's, it's going to be a lot more difficult than that. Um, and there remains to be, unfortunately, clarity on whether this is actually a way out. So um, we do not know to uh, what extent immunity can be developed. Um, I've actually had, had the virus and recovered, as has my mum. My, my dad is still in the hospital on a ventilator. I feel that I probably have sufficient antibodies now, but whether they'll wear off in another month or two is unclear. Um, if the virus can be contained, which means decreasing the R0 um, infection rate to below one for long enough that it, it effectively dies off, um, is is unclear because you cannot have this working in, say, the EU and other parts of um, the world where you have uh, the technological saturation and then have it not working in other parts of the world um, without there being a massive international consensus on travel restrictions. Um, and this is the other point of mounting pressure. Um, capitalism, well, okay, the people who 
profit from capitalism um, and people who just feel that they need to work to make a living because they're normalized into wage slavery um, are going to feel more and more agitated and more and more concerned that um, the economy or large swathes of it have been suspended. So that pressure will also mount against us. So we have two um, two things that are creating a ticking clock, and that is the, the need to keep the system going. Um, and I'll just put my cards on the table uh, ordinarily before this pandemic. I am, I'm you know, a revolutionary anarchist and anti-capitalist, and I've seen very few social orders that I wouldn't enjoy to see overthrown. Um, but this is the rare situation where we require a certain degree of social cooperation, which is going to be in partnership with um, governments as the proxies of the medical community so that people don't die. And um, it, it sort of brings into stark relief the somewhat tendentious argument from security services that we need to sacrifice a bit of privacy and autonomy to save lives when that was never justified. Now we can see the deaths. Um, we see, you know, even though we've gotten a little bit used to it, but um, hundreds of people dying every day in this country, 40,000 perhaps already in the UK. Um, that is very hard to say. I will stick to my principles and allow that because um, I believe they're more important than sacrificing them. So um, we uh, in a better position to to compromise, and um, if the the world economy does st stop or slow down to the point where supply chains fail, then this will be exasperated by mass starvation. Uh, mass starvation will lead to mass immigration, uh, or maybe I won't be the second most pessimistic person in the talk. <laughs> um, and there'll be mass immigration pressures due to the lack of resources, and there will be a wider collapse of the social order. At that point, um, suppressing the pandemic will be a pipe dream. So we don't have a massive amount of time to twiddle our thumbs on this, but we do have an opportunity to get it right if we can um, whip ourselves into order and um, moderate expectations, manage expectations of what can be done with the contact tracing, but to create a minimal viable product that maybe it doesn't need to tick every box that a cryptographer and a privacy enthusiast would want, but is not at the other end of the stream. Um, giving carte blanche to the um, Stasi elements um, that would like to have it completely normalized that everything you do is tracked for the sake of your safety. Um, um, if we can just get slightly better than nothing, and also if we take advantage of a first, first mover advantage, or just have something that works, um, prove its efficacy in a pilot scheme where you can get some voluntary buy-in at a community level, perhaps somewhere where there's um, I don't know, Berlin or somewhere where there's a lot of people that uh, would want to do it right and uh, would try and get involved and reach the point where it can be effective, so 60% buy-in, and demonstrate that it, this can be done without sacrificing privacy. But this is not going to be sufficient by itself. So without finding the ways that this is going to synergize, sorry for using that uh, catchwordy phrase, but work together effectively with other mechanisms um, and evolving the scientific understanding of, uh, so can we have an effective antibody? Um, or what, what are the other exit ramps from there being a lockdown? Um, because the problem is lockdown is not viable forever. If, if it isn't because our capitalist overlords demand that we continue to uh, you know, keep the system going so that money can be made or to avoid um, a precipitous collapse, or I think possibly just as likely people get so pissed off with this restriction on their lives that they decide maybe it doesn't matter if a few people die um, and there still is that tendency or it's two to three percent you know um, pe pe people seem to think that's an acceptable risk if they're of a certain mentality and that might become more prevalent so um, mm -hmm. there is there is work to be done um, maybe there's a chance oh thank you and also thank for sharing your own personal situation of your family um, I mean, we all really wish the best uh, to all of you and your dads. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I just have a really brief question since you went also a bit uh, long with your statement. Just if you want to answer briefly, then we pass it to mm -hmm. Joanna. Because what really concerns me mostly, and in a sense, you already mentioned that, uh, is that from one side, the idea of developing these uh, tracking apps is also to protect the vulnerable but we also know that the vulnerable are the people that are 
more easily uh, subjected to surveillance sometimes because uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, the, the surveillance mechanism is also something that targets a lot uh, activists uh, or people that are in a sense already opposing the systems so i wonder if uh, you know in a sense we put together two different kinds of vulnerability because by being an activist a whistleblower or a hacker in a sense you are already vul vulnerable for uh, control and surveillance and uh, yourself also experience that there is a protest from technology and uh, yeah <laughs> so i would like to understand from your perspective how do we solve this dilemma because it's true we should protect the vulnerable but at the same time uh, the vulnerable often are also more subjected to surveillance uh, and uh, these tracking uh, apps could make it even stronger if uh, they are not done well and we cannot really check how they are done properly. Yeah. Also, you um, know, in democratic yeah. countries is probably easier to check, but there are countries in which uh, this could also be taken as an opportunity to control even more the people. Yeah, so I don't think you can be sufficiently cynical about how um, the forces of authority will uh, use an opportunity like this to crack down on existing problems. And um, it's depressing, but it, it will happen if it isn't already happening. Um, the, the thing that we have potentially going for us is there is a necessity to have a buy-in on this. Um, so uh, as, as Julian said, people will you know, just not use their phones um, or they'll get other phones or, or they'll find a way out of this. It, it cannot be enforced and the policing doesn't really scale well enough to get people to voluntarily carry the uh, the contact tracing device with them around. So um, th there is possibly some leverage there and some ability to negotiate. Um, as to the vulnerable, I mean, I. Uh, there's two different really kinds of vulnerable um, cohorts. There's the, the people vulnerable to the disease and there's the people vulnerable to authoritarian crackdowns. And I, I'm not entirely sure how they overlap. So I, I think I'd have to think about your question a bit more. I would say they could also overlap because if you are a vulnerable mm -hmm. that gets the virus and you are also an activist, this makes it more complicated. Uh, but uh, I will now pass it all to Joanna, otherwise we don't hear her voice. Uh, so Joanna, you also want to tell us your perspective. You are based in Barcelona. How is the debate there? And then we go on with the questions of the public so we can also you know, go a bit more in depth on uh, these kind of issues we are already considering. So I pass it to you, Joanna. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks all of you for your input, Anori. I really hope your father will get better soon. I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know. Looks like a hold on there. Um, so, while well, the situation in Spain, I mean, we have the most strict confinement in Europe. Uh, situation here, uh, it's quite critical. Um, when it comes to up, <laughs> it's a big mess because uh, we have like I think more than six different apps uh, for tracking coronavirus already. Um, I mean, Spain is divided in, into its organized around autonomies. Yeah. So each autonomy is responsible to build its own app. So here in Catalonia, we have our own app, and in Madrid, they have another app. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to an expert in privacy. Uh, his name is Enrique Lujan. He's working here in Barcelona. And he told me, like the coronavirus app, for example, it's not really clear with who is sharing. Uh, data because in the privacy policy already states that uh, third party data uh, data is being shared with third parties and without disclosing anything. But well, this is quite typical Spain, I have to say. And um, according to everything that you have said, uh, I know for me it's like those days I can't help but wonder how would this crisis be solved or how we would have made it a little bit better from the very beginning. And I can't stop thinking that, at least in Spain, I think that's probably the case in Italy and the UK probably as well, that the social health uh, system has been dismantled for years and years. Yeah, and here, at least in Spain, people is dying because there is not enough respirators and there is not enough material. A lot of people is just getting, especially uh, nurses and uh, doctors, they're just getting infected and they're basically the main source of transferring the disease right now in Spain. So now I say, okay, if, would have had like a much stronger security social health system 
maybe this virus, of course, it would have been something because everything like happened at the same time, but maybe it would have been so bad, right? And uh, um, I don't know, I just believe also going back to uh, uh, what you uh, said before about having like a technical solution for everything. It seems like it's the only thing we can think about, right? Uh, and I feel like we have a, there is a huge crisis of imagination and I feel that we are unable to think about other paradigms that might also help to, uh, to relieve this crisis a little bit more. Mm. And, and then I also I couldn't help but think about tax havens. Yeah, and I feel that this, I mean, we're, being, we're talking a lot about tracking apps and whether we should have a tracking app, whether we should uh, take a uh, management of concerns in terms of privacy and so on. Like the debate has been very much about the technical solution on the problem. Yeah, um, but I didn't really hear about offshore accounts and uh, what would happen if all this money would just come back only to, you know, like the public sphere that it's where it belongs. Yeah. And I think that pretty much of the crisis and the further economic crisis that uh, we are having would also be solved through all this money. Of course, not completely, probably, but uh, according to uh, the, the digesting network, so I have my notes here since I don't have slides, um, there is eight to $35 trillion hidden in offshore accounts. Yeah, and just alone, just to put some examples of some numbers, uh, in 2019, the global gross domestic product of the world was 90 trillion, right? So those numbers, I mean, I mean, it's a lot. It's a really, There is a lot of money in offshore accounts. And something that also really called my attention, I read this article yesterday, uh, which said that the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development um, the list of COVID measures to relax the crisis was really radical in spending on the public side, uh, but not touching the wealthiest citizens or large profitable corporations. Yeah. So I don't know, I just some things like I'm not an expert in economy whatsoever, uh, but I think that's things that we should just throw on the table and discuss uh, because I feel that they've been very left out of the discussion right now. Um, and also for in terms of surveillance, what I'm, I'm very concerned if we accept this sort of surveillance that we might say, okay, now that we have like a state of alarm and, and this might be acceptable. And then when everything is over then that's it, all this data is going to be erased. Uh, the company and uh, companies are not, being, uh, are not going to be able to uh, sell this data or to use it for any other purposes. First, I really don't believe this. And, and I'm just afraid that if we accept this, it's just going to be such a strong precedent that this is just going to be normalized. Yeah. And a lot of things have been normalized since 9-11. Think what happened after 9-11, something that is important is like um, the borders uh, got diluted. Yeah. And suddenly surveillance, you had surveillance in your own home or like borders came to your own home, just like the an example, like when you have to do the ESTA, right? You have to do it from your home, which is not like a US territory, right? And I feel that since, and, and I already discussed this a lot with you, Tatiana, like since the panopticon, like all these uh, surveillance objects have become closer and closer and closer to our bodies. And what's happening now, it's like they ask us to uh, get one step further, which is controlling biological rhythms. And I think this is something that we cannot decide in two or three months, whether as a society we give out this or, or we just break this border or not, because we don't understand what the implications of this will be. And, and I think it's, I mean, the time is pressing, there is people dying and maybe an app maybe would help to relieve a little bit this, but I don't think that's the only solution at all. And I think that we have to take into account a lot of very different aspects uh, in order to be able to take a, a, a decision that in the long term, it's a, uh, Basically, it's going to crack society in ways that we won't be able to recover, especially when it comes to a, a civil rights. Um, so I think, I don't know, I mean, I, I hope it didn't sound like gibberish. It's a little bit of everything, but I just wanted to throw some things in the table that I think they're very, very worth discussing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joanna, because I think also uh, that is also why we decided to call this day uh, virus tracking and surveillance was not just uh, something polemic, but uh, 
uh, you really pointed out uh, that the solution cannot only be technical, should also be social and political. And uh, uh, personally, being Italian, I don't live in Italy since uh, now many years, but uh, I also believe that uh, when we speak about technology, we can never avoid also to speak about uh, politics and society and the impact of uh, uh, the technology into society. So you were pointing out that it's really urgent uh, to draw a map uh, of the main actors that will also benefit the most from this crisis. Uh, um, and uh, I agree with you that this is also probably our responsibility, not only after, but also at the moment. Um, and I wanted to know your perspective on this respect, especially as a researcher that have been working a lot with uh, tracking even before uh, all these debates. Uh, uh, would you like to elaborate a bit more on this idea of uh, really to draw a map on the actors uh, that are trying also to take benefit, uh, like speaking about uh, these uh, tracking uh, uh, apps that we are discussing? Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think like, I mean, we know because, you know, at the end we are some sort of reduced lead that uh, we've been researching these issues and we are highly aware of what's happening, right? But the, uh, as majority of population don't really understand who is benefiting this the most or who are the people behind this tracking, the big companies, big interest. And I feel like even in this uh, specific respect with apps, I'm a bit lost and I don't fully understand like the whole scope of interest that lie behind it. But uh, we can just understand that the pharmaceutical companies are going to benefit greatly uh, from all this data, security companies, uh, insurance companies and also governments at large. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I think it's very important that uh, people understand that in order to understand why we're being subjected uh, to some sort of surveillance uh, or why we're being just nudged to uh, have uh, some kind of solution or not other, just to act in a determined way or not the other. Yeah. So I think that's why it's very important. Feeling like. Uh, mm -hmm all this hidden ecosystem of interest that lie beyond the decisions that we are taking now. And again, I don't think we are ready to fully understand the scope yet. Um, that's why I think we need a little bit of time. And uh, maybe, you know, tax heaven managed could just relieve um, all this coming crisis by, I don't know, you know, just putting some cash into the people that really need it, uh, into the sectors that really need it. Yeah, because I feel like, uh, I hope this doesn't sound very populist. But uh, in a way, I think we are trying to, uh, I mean, the elites are not going to lose their privileges, right? And, and I think that this app is just going to help them perpetuating a little bit these privileges and any solution that comes from a civil society uh, um, initiative. I stop here. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to talk about already. Thank you. And I think also this uh, gives me the opportunity uh, to mention that uh, in May we will have a conference that is also dealing with uh, offshore uh, and eviction and at the same time with the discourse of global finance. So maybe you also want to join us uh, uh, at the end of May. And also I would like uh, to mention for people that uh, can read uh, Italian, maybe also Spanish people can read Italian, there have been a really interesting debate about tracking and surveillance on the hack meeting mailing list, that is the national hacker mailing list of Italy. So maybe on the chat uh, we will uh, send the link because, uh, for example, there the perspective was also pretty close to you, Anna, like to try to see it from more political, sociological point of view. But now I would say let's open to the question of the public. So hopefully we have a lot of them. So I call uh, uh, you, um, our great uh, Elena <laughs> in the discussion <laughs> with us. And please uh, you tell us what is the audience saying. Uh, hello, can you hear me, Tatiana? Yeah. Yeah, good. You yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a heated discussion now, and uh, I was already summarizing wow. something, so I hope Great. I will. Like <laughs> I will. <laughs> I'm, 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 yeah, I'm <laughs> apologizing already for not being able to catch on every question, but it's, uh, yeah, uh, steering a lot of discussion. So I'll try to read something that I catch, uh, that I caught so far, so please uh, 
then we, what we usually do is uh, we ask all these questions at once now and then you can decide uh, who wants to uh, give an answer to which one. So the first one uh, is uh, since apps are developed by corporation whose financial power exceeds that of governments, uh, do you think centralizing the data might be a kind of last bastion of balancing out control between government and corporations? Of course, as, uh, based on the presumption that this is centralized. Uh, second one, I think this is a cluster of questions uh, about data. Uh, what is the discussion about getting rid of these apps once Corona is done? Uh, or could it be a solution saving them as a kind of emergency reserve? Uh, what kind of data are these apps collecting? And then uh, what might be the strategies for avoiding minimalizing surveillance? As we can assume, the government will choose the apps. Uh, containers for phones, using an old phone with a pay-as-you-go chip uh, as your COVID tracker device or what other kind of uh, solutions. Um, there is one regarding Google and Apple. Uh, as far as I understood, uh, collaboration took the decentralized stance of the debate around Bluetooth tracing and uh, are integrating a decentralized protocol into their operation systems. Would that not make an additional app by a centralized authority obsolete for Apple and Android users? Would then the debate shift further towards corporate surveillance? And uh, one or two very short ones. Uh, are all these uh, apps uh, interoperable with each other? And is there a standardized protocol that every app is supposed to follow? Uh, Otherwise, the overall thing makes even less sense. And the last, I think, in this direction, wow. uh, is there any no, evidence? Remember, yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> but I will try to wrap it up here. That's why I also kind of uh, selected them in clusters. Is there any evidence, again, of long-term changes being discussed regarding health system within Europe, UK for future pandemics? There are also very interesting comments, but I think uh, I will avoid... I will stop reading here because it will be just too overwhelming for all of you and we're almost at the end of our <laughs> yeah talk i might so be able to I give um, you the efficiently answer some of the the tech questions if that's okay, okay great Go with it. um yeah so um uh, so apple and google as far as i understand are not developing apps themselves what they're developing is a set of protocols and an api an app application programming interface um that allows individual countries presumably but it doesn't need to be countries it could be non-state actors to uh, ideally it would be non-state actors to develop apps that use those um, protocols and the apis to uh, to access the technological functionality so that's that's using bluetooth flow energy to uh, silently ping and to make a point every time there is a proximity between two devices um so that is i guess n neutral and slightly to the um to the good side of the default tendency again of the nations to do it in a, a less privacy preserving manner um, and on the political point yes there, there is like a tension between um security services and and the tech companies um again where the tech companies are trying to preserve privacy more so we saw that with apple the fbi attempting to subvert their cryptography through the courts um, and then when they lost they just bought an exploit from some shady people in israel and got it that way but it's a bit of a shame um so that the, um, the, there is always this kind of tension and this uh, wrangling um so um the other point is um possibly going forward um we might have more to worry about from um these tech giants than we do from our regional um state uh, owners um but um at this point they're marginally more on our side i think um and um, I think I, I forget what the other points were. That's, that was the first thoughts I had on those questions. Mm -hmm. And who wants to follow? I can, Shall I repeat some I can questions? Add a can you remember? If you want to, yes. Um, um, I, can, I mean, I think if I, I repeat, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you, please go ahead if you want to repeat. Um, no, I no, think I think I've got more number, uh, the aspect that you think is important, and then if something has not been mentioned, I remember the questions. Yes, so um, the, 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 there's a lot of um, questions around the data, and 
deleting the data has been mentioned, also, also preserving the apps. I don't think that, for, for, first of all, answer, asking, answering that question, if you have the code for the apps and everything, you can delete data and just keep the app for any future incident. That's not a problem. It just lies around and servers isn't used. And as soon as you need need the app again, everybody installs it again. I mean, that's um, that's not so much uh, the issue. Uh, in terms of data, the way Apple and Google proposed it is that none of the data um, None of the personalizable data is really uh, like the way. So the way you would create the way data would be created would make it untraceable, and you would not be follow back as a person towards any kind of incident of of infection. So the whole idea is. Um, to to transfer anonymized data around instead of having it in one centralized database and make it trackable to a certain person. Let's put it this way. So uh, um, there's there's multiple concepts around. So um, the the whole point of making it uh, privacy protected and Apple and Google started with a with a with their API started with with as far as I understand with a version with a proposal that was quite far reaching in terms of privacy in a good way um, is that there's not even data created that can make you uh, be traced as an individual person uh, there's a lot of cryptography involved to do this but the bottom line is yes it is actually possible um, however what is being discussed right now is that the uh, whoever wants to introduce these apps is going uh, is much more is also interested in a sort of epidemiological approach on identifying individual actors to uh, to use you know machine learning AI to um, to work on this data and, and 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 do statistical analysis on this so this is far more reaching and therefore for this case you would need a more centralized service um, to answer the question of interoperability op optimally this would be a good idea because this would be um this would make sure that you can actually travel around um i am however very skeptical that this is ever going to work um even if Apple and Google uh, technology is used as a basis. Um, so hmm. uh, I, we will see on that, but uh, different states are following very, very different uh, different approaches uh, with, I think the most severe one being that uh, the United States has now signed a contract with Palantir to create a tracing app so good luck with um, that um, unfortunately we have the same yeah. in the uk where the government has done a no tender deal to connect nhs um, uh, medical records to palantir and they have a bad track record I, I encourage people to look up their track record on big data and the things they do with it um, and there's this other issue where um, um, anonymity is inherently a very fragile thing um, so where the the abstract problem of contact tracing um, you can think of it as just a computer science pro problem of creating a graph and associating that with geography but where that makes contact with the epidemiology and um, the medical record suddenly that is completely identifiable so if they're actually tracing an, an infected person and who that person has been in contact with then if that person is known to be infected then that's that's in the system that is shared centrally without um, that level of anonymity preserving properties so um, how it makes contact with the rest of the systems um, could undo all of the best efforts of the cryptographers mm -hmm. yeah. and you want, you want to add your perspective uh, well, there I are think a lot of questions, questions, questions about. Sorry. So you will need to repeat because uh, uh, I just remember the technical questions that I wasn't the best to, to answer. I think that in your respects, probably the question number three and five would be interesting. 
uh, if Elena, could you repeat just them, the one about the decentralized standards uh, for uh, corporation uh, and surveillance, and uh, the one about the health system in the European level? Could you just repeat them? Or we lost Elena? Hello? No, no, no. I'm, I'm here. Yes. Sorry. Okay. I was thinking whether I repeat those or there was one question directly to Joanna. So maybe I could read that one. It arrived a bit ah, later okay. after I read the questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a bit of improvising, but yeah. Uh, it would be great to hear a bit more about the problem, problems or ways to approach it, following what you mentioned on the focus being on a solution. Uh, this is turn... Uh, a, this in turn, I guess, uh, is lined with techno-solutionism approaches, where we come up with a technical solution that in, that in most cases does not solve the problem, nor does it address the root causes and the interconnectedness uh, to wider issues around uh, inequality or tax havens. Can you hear me? Okay, but I don't... Yeah, yeah, but I don't understand the question. Um, yeah, so... to me it was also... <laughs> a uh, moment but i think there was the last question so, that was interesting okay i can also read the, the other yeah. about uh, so on which exactly you mean tatiana so the sorry uh, what kind of data are these apps collecting uh, strategies for minimizing no, I think maybe I'm just gonna... yeah there was a question about Maybe I would just reflect add on... the perspective. Yes, <laughs> go. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, different times. Eh? Um, no, maybe on uh, adding up, uh, following what Laurie said about, uh, you know, that, uh, that maybe the those apps might be very secure, but when once this data is going to the system, and it's not secure anymore, right? And it's very much identifiable. And just to add on, on how valuable uh, medical records and data it is i mean um one of the new um trade agreements between the us and the uk after after brexit post brexit is that they want a lot of data from the national health system i'm not sure if this already happened probably Lori knows much more already about it um but this is how valuable it is it's really really valuable Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. this, this touches upon the, the issue of offshoring. Um, we, we are already being um, offshored every day in, in the data that we create and the personally identifiable verifiable information. Um, this is what we're actually paying to use Facebook and to use any uh, social media and just to use the internet is we are being strip mined mm -hmm. for information that is that directly monetized and has already been declared as the new oil, especially now oil is worth less than the barrel that it comes in. Um, so um, we money will be made on this and this will be used as an opportunity to uh, offshore this, these personal records to people that we do not necessarily trust, um, especially in the, the context of places where um, healthcare is dependent on insurance and insurance can be denied um, due to pre-existing mm -hmm. conditions. So, um, But I want to be completely pessimistic that there is there is also opportunity here. So while the, um, the calculating and the authoritarians and the centralizers of power are, are thinking about how to make uh, uh, to use this crisis for their gain and um, I you know, made a recent post saying sh sharpening pitchforks is a very good quarantine activity and what I mean is that we should be planning and organizing for how we can um, come out of this crisis with um, a collective concerted will to action and power regarding inequality regarding offshoring um, and there, there are already gains that have been made on the ground. We've seen the prevalence of mutual aid networks that have been massively empowering to local communities. We've, we've seen people come together and mm -hmm. solve problems for themselves in a way that they wouldn't have before. And this can extend to the issues of offshore um, accounts because we, um, we can't guarantee that the financial order will survive this intact and we can institute local currencies on a local level. And if I may add to that, so the only instances in where the in where the lockdown uh, measures have been fully effective and so taiwan uh, a place from india um vietnam there were apart from 
state measures, there was always support of those in quarantine involved. So um, uh, the state actually driving around and delivering food, like the state authorities driving around delivering food to people. Um, okay, surveillance involved, but the healthcare, healthcare system being respondent immediately when a phone drops off signal for a while. Um, everywhere where this, the response to this crisis actually works, there is, there is a strong level of social responsibility by everybody involved. So um, I, I do have a certain kind of hope that we, we as the Western society will also learn this. It is not only about technological surveillance and a punishing state, but it's also very much about supporting those in need. And we, we have the I opportunity to, to in, 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 oh, sorry, carry on. Yeah, let's, uh, uh, I would say, if you want to give your last uh, word, uh, Lauri, and then also from Johanna, if she wants to add something, we just do this final round, and then I think we have to uh, introduce the next appointment and close, because we're already a bit out of time, but uh, yeah, let's do, finish the circle with Lauri and then uh, Johanna. Okay, well, just to build upon the last dialectic turn there, um, we spent the, the first part of the discussion worrying about how these things that are going to be handed down to us largely that are not um, participative might go wrong or how we can stop them from being as bad as they could be or make them as good as possible. But there is the other side of the coin, and that's the opportunity here to build things up from the grassroots uh, in a decentralized or in a community basis um, and to show the uh, efficacy of society-based solutions that are not actually handed down and are not um, based upon control, but based upon um, principles of solidarity and mutual aid. Um, and so um, we all have the time and the space now to think and organize. We have the technological means to associate and to plan and, and um, to take collective action. So I think it's worth everyone exploring that because it takes away this sense of uh, helplessness and loss of control. You can turn that on its face and use this as an opportunity to explore ways of working together um, with people in your societies or building new networks of support and um, pushing them forward. I think it's very important. And Joanna, you want to add something? Yeah, well, just very briefly, and just adding on what you said previously, it's like I think that uh, this is uh, more like a social and, and political issue, like if we need to find a solution, a more than a technical one. Which, um, and I think we need time. We need time and uh, we need money, which means that we need much more uh, support from our governments, right, in economic and other, other many ways. But I'm not sure that will be possible um, because of all the things that I've already discussed. Um, but yeah, I think I will close in this. Not very optimistic, <laughs> sorry, but that's my approach. Yeah. Thank you, and so I really want to thank you all and we invite here uh, Jonas from the Disruption Lab that will introduce the next topic of the first of May. So we, in a sense, also go on with this discussion about the political and social aspect. Uh, Jonas, you want to tell us what happens next uh, Friday? Sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, mute your microphone uh, since we're sitting away from each other. Uh, we're speaking into each other's microphone. Um, yes. Uh, nice to be here on screen for once. Uh, so next week the theme will be a lockdown or crackdown. Um, we'll be talking about uh, new ways of protest um, now that everyone is uh, limited from going out in the streets and making their voices heard. I'll try to share a screen here. You can see what's happening today. The camp supposed to be in front of the Berlin Reichstag, for example, um, where they now have collected uh, thousands of posters. And there is a live stream going on at the moment um, in lieu of uh, these demonstrations. So uh, people are trying to figure out um, what to do. Uh, next week will also be 1st of May. And 
with empty streets, um, probably. Uh, and this at the same time as uh, leaders in many countries are using the crisis to push through uh, new legislations that, to extend their powers, as we're seeing in, in Hungary or Poland, for example. And we will have uh, with us uh, Stellan Windhagen, a Swedish professor of sociology who is specialized in nonviolent action uh, for many decades, uh, has been part of more than 30 uh, actions, mainly uh, anti-war and against uh, nuclear uh, arms, uh, and has done, uh, I think if you added up, about a year in jail for this, uh, and is using his um, experiences to formulate theories about how does nonviolent action and civil disobedience work, how do movements work, and what makes them um, successful. Uh, we also have uh, Mauro Mondello, Italian investigative journalist, who also uh, uh, helped co-curate uh, our conference